Give me the mic. Give me the mic, Will. I'm like, oh, Lord. That's why I'm so hot right now. I feel like I was over there rocking that motherfucker. Is that what you're kind of mainly doing, just hosting right now? Just yeah, right there, yeah. Hosting. How was the, uh, what's bro name, Huncho? Huncho, yeah. You hosted that last night. How was that? I ended up DJing, man. They ended up, it was like, well, we want you to DJ the show. I'm like, oh, man, all right, cool. So okay. I ended up DJing. I opened up for Huncho's DJ, and um, he brought out Huncho. So it was a real, it was a, it was a quick show. It wasn't even like, they had no openers on the tour. It was just him on the show? Just him. Yeah. How long was Sold it? Sold out. Mm. You know, so I went on from 7.30 to 8.45. I mean, 7.30 to 8.15. His DJ went on from 8.20 to 8.30. And Concho came out. It's probably and, over by like 10. Yeah. Where was so, it at? Nova. Mm. Yeah. That joint was... I wasn't even popular. hip to bro so you told me about him. And then yeah. I think right after you told me about him, I was watching the the new episode of... I think it was the final episode of It Could Have Been House. You okay. seen the Drewski show? Yeah. He was on there, I think. For real? Have you seen the show? Yeah, I love the show. The last episode, they had pulled him up. I think he was... He wasn't on the show, but they had pulled a video up of him, like, doing something. I forgot exactly what now, but okay. it was like Huncho. I was like, that's bro that Will yeah. was talking about. Yeah, Huncho, he, he, real, he popping in Atlanta right now. Like, he really, like, one of those, for real. And it's like he can sell tickets, so it was like, that's really, you know, as long, if you're an artist were coming from Atlanta and you knew, and you could sell tickets, you can tour, for real, for real, so... He he got a he had like twenty four cities to go, so he going all of them damn that sold out. The girls love him though, so you know he make a lot of relationship songs, a lot of sex songs. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like that's what your songs are too. You like all yours be like twerk joints, like yeah, twerk dance songs, songs like. Songs, yeah. <laughs> that's all I do is make girl songs and twerk songs, like for real, like that's it. Bro, you've been doing shit out here for a while. Like I like I was saying, I've seen I just been following you on Instagram. Yeah. For like a few years out here. Yeah, for sure. And then you even sent me kind of like. A bunch of notes of more stuff that you did. I didn't even know it went that far back. Your yeah, your, your sure. journey kind of starts in like two thousand six, seven. Yeah, that's when I graduated. You know, it's like right around that time. Is I went right on tour, pretty Ricky, right after that I, I graduated high school. So it's like mm. I was supposed to do the college thing, and it was like, nah, I'm gonna just. Is that like that was like peak pretty Ricky too, right? That was peak pretty Ricky. This was pandemonium. That's how I learned that word pandemonium. Mm. That word pandemonium. It was like. I remember we went to a radio station in South Carolina, bro, and it was like they wanted us to do, they wanted them to do an autograph signing at an uh, amusement park out there. Bro, we walked in the park, and, you know, spectacular. That's the light-skinned one. He's, like, the shortest one for real. He starts, he takes off running, and it's like girls, like 500, 600 girls mm. just start running behind him. And I remember it was this old white man. And he was so mad. Girls. He, he was like, just so mad. mad. He said, "This is pandemonium out here. It's pandemonium." I just kept hearing that word. I'm like, what does that mean? I, I, I looked it up, and I was like, "Okay." What was, was Pretty Ricky's like? Kind of like biggest hit that everybody knows on the Hotline. Hotline. Yeah, um, that's their biggest record. Bro, even in those times, like fame was different. Oh yeah, that was when yeah you really getting chased. Yeah, you for sure. Like those were one of six and Park days. Those were like girls crying, screaming. Passing out, you know what I'm saying? When they would see Pretty Ricky, Bow Wow, you know, Omarion, like those are the those are the good days. These days it's not like that. They scream for real love, but it's not as much as heart throbbish, you know what I'm saying? Like they called them heart throbs back in the day. So it's like the girls just had their posters all over their walls and you know, girls don't do that stuff no more. They don't put posters up in you know, put now, now they're just trying to figure out how to get a bag off you. Nah, for sure. Yeah. That's it. The girls bigger finesses, uh, finesses than the guys now, I feel like. Nah, for sure. What was okay, so this was like 07. What was kind of this was 08. 08. Yeah. What was the climate of the game like at that time? Like how were you how were you looking at the game? Like would you like what was your plan kind of moving forward? Um I feel like things have changed a lot now. And also I know you were on the street team. Yeah. The Def Jam Street team? Yeah, that's We, had, we had Batman up here, too, so he was kind of telling us a bit about that. Yeah, Batman put me on, man. Like, man, without Batman, there would have been no none of this for real. I ain't even going to lie. Like, I take my hat off to Batman because he, like, he 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 came to me and was like, yo, Will, I see you throwing these parties in your neighborhood. Like, let us let me lace this, the block up. I'm like, what is that lace the mean? block. Like, he was talking about, like, bringing uh, posters and putting them on the light poles on my grandma's block. Because, mind you, my block parties was crazy back then. This you gotta is understand. High school. Yeah, this is right after high school. So you got to understand, like, back in 2007, 2008, there was no promoters in Hampton. Like, 
my cousin Jay King and all of them, they went to Phoebus. So it wasn't even com competitive. It wasn't even like a competition. It was like my big cousins was throwing a party, so I went. They little cousins throw parties, so they come to my parties. But it's like they was a whole bunch of football players over there throwing parties. And me, I was just alone by myself. But my grandmother used to let us throw these house parties on her block. And the house parties just started turning into block parties for real. And it's like we would do it every month for real. So it's like everybody started getting used to these block parties. And that's just how I got my name for real. Like they started calling me the party king just off of those block parties, you know? So, yeah. Was there like artists performing at these parties or was it more uh, just a party vibe? No, when I was just partying. Like everybody outside, people be on the grill. Girls be twerking, you know what I'm saying? Like, we playing, whole, back then they was playing a whole bunch of, like, Jersey Club. See, a lot of Jersey Club and stuff is, like, popular now. But it was a really long break. Like, Jersey Club was popping. Baltimore Club was popping back in 07, 08 in this area for real. But it just started getting popular for, like, the worldwide now. But back then, that's where all the girls was dancing to. So the block be lit. They be twerking to that. And it be crazy for real. Like, bro, our block, our block parties was retarded, bro. Like a thousand people out there, no exaggeration. Mm. And this is in this was in Hampton. Yeah, this is Hampton. Oh, Mary Mac, Carrie. It used to be called Carrie Brook, Mary Mac, but they changed the name now to like Avalon or something like that. So Batman came through and laced the block up. Did he come? Did Bro, he lace the block he, up? He, he, he laced it up with like, I think like Joel Santana merch. Like it was like what's the game has been missing album. Like Joel Santana album just came out. He came out there, laced the block up. Whole bunch of, <laughs> I remember the next day, my grandmother asked me, was like, why are these posters all over? They you laced my clean, fucking block yeah, up. I ain't said they could do all that. Stuff up out here. It's trash. Call it trash. So, but yeah, that was my first time working with Bat. And um, actually, that was the first time he came to the block party, the actual last block party I ever had. They came, they told my grandmother, they said, you throw one more block party. The cops. You, you No, the rental office. Mm. So you throw one more party, you're out of here. My grandma said, you better not throw, ever throw another party here. Damn. But it was to the point where it was like, everybody got so used to these parties. And I wasn't like thinking about the money back then. It wasn't even about the money. It wasn't about no business, no being a promoter. It was just me That's having a whole bunch of friends. You know what I'm saying? So everybody just was like looking for me to throw something for everybody to come to. So I think like a week later, my brother Fame, he was like, man, we need to get a building, like, we need to throw a party, like, like, like charge people. <laughs> I was like, charge people? I was so against it. I was like, nobody here don't want to pay to get in no party. Like, how much we going to charge them? It ain't been $5, like, $5, $10. Like, let's just charge them something, you know? So we got to pay for stuff, like, the building, the security, and all that, so. At the block parties, people were just coming in for free, coming, eating was, for free, yeah, everything was free? Was, everything was free. And they outside yeah. from 7 that night to damn near 2, 3 in the morning, man. How did it work out when you started paying? Like, was it? No, it was, bro. The first charging, party that we not, not threw, yeah. the first party we threw was at the Hampton Golf Course, um, over there, like Thomas Nelson, like over that. On way. the golf course, like it was, it was the clubhouse okay, on the yeah. golf course. Yeah. And when the Batman was there too, he laced it up. He laced the whole building <laughs> yeah. up there. You know, because you know they that, say like when you start, if you start doing stuff for free, it's kind of hard to start charging. Like, no, nah, for sure. You know what I mean? I was, I was against it, you know, but we had, uh, we had printed out flyers and. You know, we was just at the mall. Back then, it was the Hampton Coliseum was still, like, you know, up. And we was in the mall passing out flowers and everything. And it, it got to the point where at 7 o'clock, I just felt that. Because you got to understand, this is not social media. It's no, you know, it's no really text messages. I think it's probably like MySpace, you know what I'm saying? So we posted on the MySpace like, wall. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, no, 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 no. This is oh, this is oh six. Okay. This is my first ever party. So this okay. is my senior year in, in high school. So... We we got to the building at seven. It was already people lined up down the going down the hill, and I'm just like, okay, people are already in line. It's not even eight o'clock yet, you know. Man, I remember I went in. We went to go set up. We had to like take all the little chairs and stuff down that they had in there. By the time we got back outside, the line was all the way down to the front of the parking lot, like already two mm. two hundred people, two three hundred people there. And that was my first party, and it was crazy. It's at the golf course. First and last party, though. They fucked the bathroom up. Hey, yo. <laughs> Everything. They they had crack in their windows. Um, it was it was bad. The, the parking lot, trash everywhere. It was crazy. But it, that was one of my biggest parties. 
Are there lessons that you learned from these early parties that you kind of still carry with you to this day? Like, oh, what, yeah. what did you learn? For like, there's like probably a bunch of them. Like, yeah, what's yeah, what's some of those I lessons? I mean, I just started you like dudes, adults. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, just, <laughs> you you can't you can't just. Um, I learned early, don't let the drunkest person in the club. Don't let the drunkest person in your party. If they're drunk at the front, don't let them in the club, because mm-hmm. that person is gonna always be the one. That's gonna fuck your party up. Cause trouble. You know what I'm saying? Just because he's from your neighborhood and you know him, just because that's your friend, don't mean he won't fuck up your business. You know what I'm saying? And I learned that early. Cause I done let a couple people slide. But they was the reason why I couldn't go back somewhere. Mm. So they fucked up the money. I just made four thousand dollars. This you know what I'm saying? I got another party next week, and now the owner's like, well, no. I don't know about this. I don't know about it, man. I don't think we should do it again. Like, I just lost out on four thousand dollars. You know what I'm saying? That's why you know even at bartenders, like part of their job is to recognize when someone is too drunk and yeah. cut them off. Oh, for sure. I've actually got. I tried to go to Peabody's one. Like this was like years back. I was drunk as shit at the door. They wouldn't let me in. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what do you think I'm gonna do? Right when I get in there, I'm gonna get drunk. Like, I love, <laughs> but yeah, they ain't let me in. Like, bro, because I tried to go in like three times. Like, if you try to, if you come back one more time, you're going to jail. Right, for I was sure. Like, Fuck it. But um, but yeah. No, that was kind of just. That's kind of like my main one right there for real. The drunk people just uh, don't let them in. Don't let them in early. Like they gotta go. But like, bro, you have to make the next one, bro. You know. But other than that, though, I mean, it's not too many. I just learned. I just learned a lot of things as I went, man. It's just trial and error with this party shit. Like it's entertainment, so it's not too many things you can't do. It's not too many things you can't do. It's just like follow the book and don't just don't do bad business. And you know what I'm saying? You got to keep your clientele because all these people that's coming to this party coming to support you. They come to get giving you their money. So it's like you know you just got to smile and just you know be. It's like any any company. You know like what I'm a certain saying? Certain level of professionalism. Yeah, got to. It's like Chick Fil A. You know what I'm saying? Like you gotta just act a certain way with certain people, man, for them to come and fuck with you. Cause I always tell people, I've always like respected everybody that like support me. Cause they don't gotta come spend this money with me. They don't gotta pack all my parties. They don't have to call me the party king. You know what I'm saying? But at an early age, that shit just came about. Cause it was like so many people was just fucking with me. And I just gave so much love back. So it was like, you know, I'm, I'm in different neighborhoods, though. See, people don't understand how big I got. It was just the fact of the matter that I was just in so many different neighborhoods at the time. My aunt stayed here. My grandma stayed there. My mama stayed there. My cousin stayed on these blocks. And you know what I'm saying? So I'm in this hood, that hood, this city, that city. They like, yo, what's up with the party, man? I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And then they just, when I throw the party, they all coming. You see what I'm saying? This is before social media. So it was a lot of just word of mouth for real. You know what I'm saying? I think at the end of the day, too, with, like, throwing events and shit, you, I think you got to remember that you're doing a service for the people. Right. It's, like, not even about you, for real. It's not. It's about these people that want to leave their house and have fun, have a good time. And usually people just really just want to get out and fucking drink and dance. <laughs> no, nah, for sure. So if you got good music, a safe space, good venue, I feel like you, it's hard to, it's hard to mess up. No, nah, it is. It doing good hard. business, like you said. Yeah, you got to. And people want you to come back to their establishments. Like, um, what maybe touch on like momentum, building momentum from each one to the next one. Maybe are they like getting bigger and oh yeah. It's, it's, it's always got bigger, man. It's like the venues, I would I would say breaking it down venue to venue to venue. So if you was to say the golf course was the first one, I was the last one. After that, I was able to take it to the entertainment center, which was called Checkers. Back in the day, which is Checkers. where I shot my uh, dab on a video sh- video at uh, Mercury Entertainment Center is what they call it there. So a lot of my big parties was there at that building for for a little amount of time, probably for like a year. And then after that, we moved it to the skating ring, the Plaza Roller Rink. Those parties was epic. Like those are the parties that kind of stamped me, like stamped me. The skating ring. The parties. skating ring parties. Those are the ones, bro. Like those are the those were, those was, were the days. Yeah, what was different about those? Those those parties was just, bro, it was just like the, I can't, okay, put it like this. Back then, what I used to do was, like, I'm, I'm like a scout. Like, I'm like a and to the streets. It's like, I went to every high school and picked the, 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 the coolest person. Like, whoever's the popularest person in this school, I want them on my team. 
So if you popular, you play basketball. If you just you dope, you dress. You know what I'm saying? You you rap. Whatever you do, if you do something, and you popular. I need you a part of my my situation. And what I do was I will put two or three people from every school on my street team. So this is how I used to get the word out. Now, mind you, everybody's coming from these different cities, these different areas, to the skating ring. Everybody is which, coming. Which skating rink was this? Plaza Roller Rink or Al Row. Okay. It's no longer there. They, they've been shut it down years ago. But uh, all of these different areas, it's just in this one spot. We're talking Shell Road, Buck Road, Uptown Newport News, Downtown Newport News, Williamsburg, a couple people from across the water. You know, but everybody is partying together. So I'm responsible for a lot of people's babies around here. Like a lot of people got pregnant because (laughs) they met their baby daddies at big wheel parties, bro. I'm telling you, it it get it get deep. It get real deep. But back in the day, like those those parties, those those were the ones, man. Like the energy, the the just it was just popping. Like I can't explain it. Like it just had to be there. Did you actually go to like physically go to these high schools? To find these people, like how are you? Um, no, I've always kind of, man. I've always been okay. So, like I said, I graduated back in '06, so it was like around this time. This was like '08, '09, when I was in and out of town with Pretty Ricky. So my brothers was like, it's two years younger than me. So they, they were, were they, they was the ones yeah. that was like still, you know, in the schools going around because I just didn't want to deal with the little kids no more. Like I felt like I was just older. Like I'm not going back to high school. You know what I'm saying? To see no teachers and stuff. So I sent my brothers, I sent my friends, and people would come to my grandmother's house to like pick up their little flyers like every Tuesday. So I would have like pizza at the house, and they would come over. They'll pick up their flyers, you know, get some pizza, and they'll they'll go. Mm. This is what I used to do this every street Tuesday. Team you're this building is my street team of popular high school kids popular high and school different kids. high schools. Yeah. Is this, so I'm assuming this is after you were working with Def, on the Def Jam street team. Yeah, so I you mean, learned yeah, like a is, bunch of shit there. Then I mean, you yeah, I, I learned I learned team. how to market with yeah. with Batman and them. Like I learned how to go out and meet friends and people like that wasn't from my area because you gotta understand like I was cool with people, but it was mostly a street thing. It was mostly street. It was never like corporate. It was just always street with me. You know what I'm saying? It was like I always wanted to be like this 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 guy. His name is Yancey. He had a company called New Face Entertainment, and this is the reason why I started my company, Members Only Party Group, back then. I had to go get my business license and everything because I wanted to be like Yancey. He had Hampton University on lock. Mm. But the way that he threw his parties and the way that I threw mine, it was different, and this is what opened my eyes. When I go into Yancey's parties, it was the quality of the party. It was the girls. It was just, it was everything. My parties, it's just hood. Mm, Home like, street like, shit. Like raw type shit. Yeah, like a fight could break out any moment. You know what I'm saying? Was Yancey that part parties, of the appeal? Like, this is... You said who? Was that part of the, like, appeal for people? I mean, back then, <laughs> I don't know. It's just... It, like, you don't know what's going to happen at bro party. You, like. you don't. You really don't, bro. It could be a shootout. It could be anything happen. You don't really know. But I'm going to tell you right now, it was like a saying back in the day. It was like, if a fight don't break out at your party, your party won't live. Mm. And it was like to the point where I was like, that shit not cool. That shit sounds stupid as hell. But it's like every time a fight broke out, it was one of those big ass parties. And it's like I feel like like you said, it's the thrill, maybe. I didn't like it because I don't like the I don't like drama. I don't like I don't like a lot of shit going on. I don't like a bad name. So it was like them other boys that was throwing parties, people would get shot. Thank God to this day, nobody's never got shot at a big world party. Nobody ever has got shot at one of my parties. Ever. It might have been a shooting. Like people shooting in the air, driving out the parking lot and stuff. But I've never had no no wild shit happen. You know what I'm saying? Somebody might have passed out, got a car to M lamp, shit like that. But all my parties definitely was safe back in the day. And that's why a lot of people around the area, their parents and stuff like that, liked our parties because of how we would security, the security, the police, everything. Oh, so you have an actual police. There but too. that came after what I learned from Yancey. Mm, he had the high quality. Exactly. Man. So mind you, these couple parties that I'm telling you about is like my first three or four parties. It was just out of control. No security for real. My homeboys from the block just there, you know. We ain't really pat people down. You know what I'm saying? It was it was just bad. Letting all the drunk dudes yeah, in. Letting all the drunk dudes in, you feel me? But it's like when I when I saw what Yancey had and I heard it's like, yo, these security guards and these police, they cost. Like, you go down into the city, you gotta, you gotta rub shoulders with the city people. You need to make they need to be your friend. And then once you start involving the city, now you need all the proper permits, all the licenses. Exactly. Like, a lot of a lot of rules got made in the city of Hampton and Newport News because of big wheel parties. 
Mm. Like a lot of like tax bonds, they created that out of nowhere. Like, what do you mean by tax bonds? A tax bond is like when you have to pay a percentage of whatever you feel like your ticket sales is going to be. So if you feel like you're going to have a thousand people at your party and everybody's going to pay twenty dollars to get in, $20. so then you know ten percent of that. You pay it to the city before yes. the party even happens? No, after the party. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Before the party was, that's what it was supposed to be in the beginning. But then they started to do it the opposite, you know, the opposite way. It was just dumb. It was just, they was making up rules, man. They tried to take us to court. They tried to sue me. It was a lot of stuff, bro. The city tried to sue you? They tried. The bro. city of Hampton? They. I don't know if it was, no, I don't think it was city of Hampton. It was, it was like, it was a letter that came in, and I remember my grandfather said, somebody's trying to sue you. And I was just like, I'm not going to court. Like, I'm back then, I just hated court so bad. So it was like, from around that time, I don't remember what happened, but I just ignored it. Like, I just didn't really, I didn't ever even... They never, so that was the end I, of bro, it? I never went to court for it. Like, I never uh. cared, for real. It's like, like I said before then, this is around the time before I learned all the business stuff with Yancey. Did he, like, pull you to the side and tell you certain things, or you just kind of witnessed it and you observed no, what man, he was doing? No, man, Yancey, um, I, I, I was living um, on the campus of Hampton, Hampton University, like, throwing apartments that's right in front of it. And I remember one day, it was one of his DJs, and he was like, yeah, man, we got a meeting. You know, I was like, well, shoot, can I come? And he was like, yeah, yeah, come on. You know what I'm saying? Come to the meeting. Come chill. So I remember I walked in there, and it was like a classroom or whatever, and it was just a whole bunch of just dope college people, like, I was just like, all these people are just cool. Like, everybody that's around Yancey is just cool. Everybody. The girls, the guys, everybody was just dope. That's why I came up with the idea, like, yo, I need to go and get these high school kids. Like, I need to go figure out, like, I can find out the, the popular, coolest person at these schools. So was it mainly, I guess, high schoolers going to the parties? These, no, these it... are, I'm only throwing high school parties at this time. I'm not okay. throwing college parties yet. Okay, okay. This is the high school still, high school days in me. Yeah, so yeah. mind you, when I graduated, like I said, my brothers and all of them were still in school. And all I know was throwing high school parties. I never threw a college party until after I got deep in with Yancey. Okay. And that's what changed my whole life for real, for real. Mm, when we're way. talking money-wise, like financial, I never had a job back then, bro. Like, ever since I was young, it was like growing up, it was like, okay, get a job, go to school. Bro, I was making so much money from parties, I didn't have no job, no day job, no none of that. Like, I tried it, I tried it out back in the day. Like, I had, like, a little a little a telemarketing job or whatever, for real. But my grandfather, like, if you live in this house, you know, you got to have a job, you know. But I'm making so much money with parties, I ain't need no damn job. So you okay? So you go to this meeting with this Yancey dude. Mm -hmm. You said the the first college one kind of like changed your life. What was that first one like? The first college party that I went with Yancey. Or you, it, that you threw, I guess. No, the first college party I threw was with Yancey. Okay. It was called Banana Split. I don't know why he called it that, but it had <laughs> bro, something like I did to not, do. I didn't come up with the name. That was. It had something to do with like the fraternities, though. It had something yeah. to do with something about a fraternity. But the first party I threw with Yancey was called Banana Split, and when I say. At the end of the night, we sat there, we counted that money, man. And I mean, my parties, you know, before then, you know, I was making a good 3000 2800 It was probably like off ticket sales? No, I mean, oh, well, people were just paying at the door. We wasn't selling tickets back then. I didn't know nothing about this until I got around Yancey. So me and Yancey sat down at the end of the night. And he was like, yeah, well, so this is a 50 50 situation, 50%. You got to pay the security, 50%. I pay the security, 50% the DJ, 50% everything. I'm like, all right, cool. Now, mind you, this shit is packed. It's a capacity in here. Over, over a thousand people. Where, it, where was it at? It's at the Mercury Entertainment Center. Okay. And I remember we sat there, bro, and this is the night that me and my brother, like, looked at each other and said, this is what we want to do for the rest of our life, bro. Throw parties. Throw shows. Throw events. This is what we got to do. So we broke down. It was twenty seven thousand dollars after profits? Yes. That was your half, or that was like total? No, that was what we split 50-50. Uh, twenty seven thousand dollars. What the fuck? And, and that's it, after paying everybody. That's after paying everybody. Yo, what the fuck? So after we, so when we did that, it was like, okay, what do we do with this money? Like I reinvested, or it's like we didn't know. You know, we didn't know. You know, we just got money. So, of course, you know, what my little brothers going to do, they go buy, buy clothes, buy shoes, 
You know, we just outside. We just outside, bro. We didn't have no structure. And I asked Yancey, it's like one day Yancey pulled up on me, man, and Yancey, it was like Yancey had his own uh, like own car. He had his own crib. And I was just like, Yancey, like, you know, it's got to be deeper than this. Like, he was just like, man, I'm a businessman. Like, I just know how to, you know, do business. This ain't, you know, this is my life. This is what I do. Like, I throw parties to make money, but this is my business. I pay taxes on this shit. So I'm just like, well, what's, you know, well, teach me. And he was like, you for real? He was like, well, like, you, you don't know about this already? I'm just like, no. Because I was really interested in my college friends because I felt like they were smarter than me because they went to college. So it was like I wanted to learn what I couldn't learn because I was always on the road with Pretty Ricky. So I wasn't in school where I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be in college. Were you, like, enrolled? I was supposed to go to Hampton University. I was supposed to go to school. But the thing about it was it was like I did never go because I went straight on tour right after I graduated high school. So it was like Yancey and it was just like I was just looking up to them like it was big homies to me. Like, dang, bro, y'all got y'all stuff to, in order. Y'all teaching me all this stuff, you know? So it was like once he, t- he broke it down, the money, expenses, payouts, your team, how you treat people, how you do things. And he really sat there for about four hours and gave me the game. He only gave me this conversation one day. Yes, he never came back and had this conversation with me again, ever. And I told myself from that point on, bro, I don't know if it was just the competitive in me. Like, just I just always want to be number one. I always want to be the best. And from that point on, bro, me and Yancey became, like, it was like, I felt like we was enemies, bro. Like, it was like. Why? Because it was competitive at that point. Because I wasn't throwing parties with them no more. I was throwing my own. On mm-hmm. nights that he was throwing parties. So now we splitting the city up. So now mm-hmm. it's getting crazy. You know what I'm saying? It's getting wild. Like, my party's popping, his party's popping. It was to the point where it's like, bro, like, I didn't understand y'all stronger together. I was like, shit, I got the sauce. I'm about to, you know what I'm saying? Go do my own thing with my own friends. Like, these street niggas, I fuck with street niggas. All these college boys and shit, I ain't fucking with these college boys. You know what I'm saying? All I know is street niggas. You know what I mean? So it was a different vibe. See, me and my friends was different. I would go fuck with Yancey and them, and they would have their own friends. That was my getaway from my real life, though. My real life was some street shit. My college friends was like my, my chill life. Like, I go around them. I know ain't nobody going to get shot today. I know I ain't going to be no street shit. All they doing is smoking weed and just kicking it. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. So, that's how, that's how it was. But I feel like the older that we got, we started to really, like, come back. And he, I just always told him, yes, he, thank you, bro, for, like, teaching me. So how you to got do really this like real. enemies for a while over there? No, no, it was probably like a, just like a, a school year. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't long at all. Cause I mean we never said anything to each other. But you know, girls would get involved and people would be on my team and people would be on their team and people would just be talking back and forth. You know, we just hear stuff. But me and mm-hmm. him never like had an argument or anything like that. So y'all make twenty seven thousand, I guess, each, or y'all start split on that first one. Mm-hmm. Do you guys come back? After you start doing your own, own, do you come back? Is there like a reunion show? Did you have y'all thrown another one after yeah. that one? Yeah, I mean, but then it didn't come for like another two years. Okay. It's, it came back because we couldn't use that building for a while. Like because we couldn't use that building for a while, that's what started a lot of the bullshit. Because I told you we was together, and then once we couldn't use that building, I, I went to the plaza. I went to the bowling alley. He would throw his bowling parties, I would throw my bowling parties. It was just, you know... Neck and neck and neck and neck. You feel me? Two so, bowling parties is crazy. Yeah. Well, and also, realistically, there's probably, well, definitely, there's enough people in the cities to where you can have multiple big parties going on probably on the same night. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess when did you start making your own music? Music? Yeah. I mean, I started making music probably like, I mean, I was, I was always just beating on the desk and rapping when I was in school. So I would make little songs like that, but actually recording, um, my boy Spencer, he put me on to like recording myself. Uh, we had a computer at my grandmother's house, and that was my first time recording my own little song for real. It was with him, and from that point on, shoot, I just been rapping every since for real. But Spencer definitely taught me how to like you know mix and master and make beats on Fruity Loops. We was using Fruity Loops back in the day, you know. So me and Spencer was using a lot of stupid things back in the day. We were just trying different softwares out, but uh, Fruity Loops kind of got like the popular. 
the best sounding. You know what I'm saying? And it just yeah. we was recording ourselves on Fruits, bro, before Fruits could record up there. So how are you doing it, bro? I don't care. I can't. This was so long ago, but trust me, me and Spencer was making songs on Fruit Loose before that was a feature on Fruit Loose, bro. That don't really make sense, but all right. I know it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. But trust me, Spencer was always finding ways to record us. And he was like, bro, we should do it like this. Because we could turn these vocals up and we can make it sound. Because we was doing shows. I was doing talent shows and stuff like that. So we always wanted the best sound. So we were just trying things out. I seen on the notes you sent, it was like your family actually had talent shows? Yeah, my family had talent shows every Thanksgiving. Like mm -hmm. every Thanksgiving, it was a talent show at the family. It was like a family reunion type of thing. But we did it every Saturday of Thanksgiving weekend. And it used to get crazy. Okay, so you're okay. So now at this point, you're throwing these shows or throwing these parties mm -hmm. at the bowling alley, the plaza, different different uh, spots. Right. What was kind of from there? You so, said like what was what happened from there? Oh, um, after that, I mean, shoot, man, I just I started to fall in love more with uh, with just like being on the road. Like I used to love being on the road, bro. Like staying in Virginia was just not a thing for me back then. I just had to go. Like, I had to leave. Like, I started getting friends in other cities and stuff like that. But nothing was like being in Virginia. Because it was, I feel like I made more, most of my money in Virginia. I felt like I had more of a, I didn't have no competition in Virginia. It was only me. You know, I feel like out in the mother cities, I'm out there trying to do what I would do here. And it's six big wheels in Atlanta. It's six big wheels in Charlotte. So it wasn't working. And it made me come back home. And that's why I respect the area so good. Because anytime I needed to come and throw a party, make some money or whatever, the support is always there. It's not hard. I went out there and tried to throw some parties, man. And I lost money, like, mm -hmm. multiple times. To the in point Atlanta, where I, like... Yeah, I wanted to give up. Like, I don't want to throw no parties in Charlotte no more. Man, Charlotte don't like me. I don't want to throw no parties no more in South Carolina. That South Carolina don't fuck with me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you lived your, your whole life here, built all these connections. Yeah. And so it's like, I got, you know, to like these days, you know, it's kind of like different because we, you know, you book artists, you, you know, you go to those cities for big weekends and it makes sense now. But I made like a lot of trial and error back in those days, though. Like I wasn't even like 21 yet for real. So I was making a lot of mistakes, like just spending money. Like I said, just doing stupid shit, being young, making all that money with no goddess. That's what it was. Making all that money with no goddess. And it's just like you just out here just having fun. You think you're doing big dog or whatever until, you know, you end up broke again. And then you try to get that twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 back. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like that's what it was being early ages, the roller coaster of making money with this party shit. Just being an entrepreneur, period. Like, that's anybody just in the game trying to come up off of being an entrepreneur, working for themselves. You know what I'm saying? You're going to take your losses. You're going to take your wins. You just got to do it the right way. But I learned as I went, though, and it got better, it got better, it got better, it got better all the way to to now. You know what I'm saying? In these in these early days, was the, what was the local scene like, the music scene around here? Oh man, shoot, man, it was only like two rappers for real. I think that was Big probably Kev, like, was like Fair Quan at that time. Was yeah, he like Quan, Quan, uh, Big Kev. Um, but there was no like scene for like nobody was really performing. Like I mean, they was no... doing little shows and stuff here and there, but. I don't, I don't remember nothing too crazy. It's not like like now, you know. Back then, it was just like four or five artists probably that was popping, and everybody kind of just gave them their respect, you know what I'm saying, back in the day. But no, this now is way bigger than what it was back then. Mm. Mm -hmm. So when did you, I guess, start hosting like other people's parties? Oh, shoot. After I came home from prom, DJing from Pretty Ricky, it was like club scene. And it was like, that's the reason why I kind of started being like a, a big host out here because I learned how to host being in other cities. In Virginia, there was nobody out here doing that on the mic. Nobody was doing what I was doing. I'm so used to... What were I'm, you doing? Like, the way I was hosting while the DJ was DJing and I'm on the mic and I'm just controlling the party, being the MC for real. There was nobody doing that before I was doing it for real. There was I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. Nobody was doing it how I was doing it. Because I'm I'm so used to working in arenas. So when I'm rocking stuff, I'm so used to 30,000 people in front of me. I come mm. back to Virginia, it's, it's 300. Energy, like, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So the energy that I was given, it was like, yo, let's take a big wheel. Up. It made it feel like an arena. Yeah, it made it feel like, like it was crazy. Like, yeah, let's take a big wheel in here, wilding. 
And I'm just like, bro, this is all this is all I know. You know what I'm saying? So just learning at that early age and bringing it back to Virginia was pretty Ricky, like separated. It was just no more. This is around like 2009, 2010 was around that time that I started throwing parties at the clubs in Virginia. So now it's no more house parties. There's no more skating rings. There's no more bowling alleys. There's no more college parties. All of that is officially dead. I only had that window from 2006 to 2010. Now, all of my peers are grown. There's no more college, there's no more high school shit. Everybody's so partied out that I don't even got the same friends no more. They're not even trying to really post my flyers or come out for real. Everybody's just kind of like, no, nah, well, we good, we going. So now it's like you're starting fresh with like a yeah, new crowd? new team, new crowd, new friends. You know, like everybody that was with me every day, all day, they was just, I guess they were just like, well, we tired of doing this. We've been doing this for like six years with you. Mm, Five yeah. years with yeah. you, like, you know. So I had to go meet new friends. I had to go meet, you know, new people. And being in the club scene, it was kind of cool because every week is somebody different that I would meet. And I just build relationships and stuff like that. But it was always on, on the Norfolk side, Virginia Beach side of the water. I was never doing because back then there were no clubs in Hampton, Newport News, but the alley. It's probably still like that now. No, it's a couple. It's a couple clubs. We got some clubs, but as far as the creative scene and the really the dance scene, I would say it's on that side. Yeah, for sure. Like out here, it's not really like I don't know. Like over, over there, you across the water, you can actually go to different bars and clubs where it's filled with creatives in there. Yeah, and it's actually a good vibe. People dancing. Yeah, out here, I feel like it's more bars. Yeah, it's more bars. Stand around like it's not. Um, yeah, it's more bars. The dance culture is not like that. I don't think more lounges. No, I mean, when, when, I mean, I feel like there's not a lot of clubs in Virginia no more. All the clubs shut down. Like all the big clubs, like the Broadways, the Origamis, you know, the Picassos. Like all yeah, I these forgot clubs. About, I remember people talking about Origami like back in the day. Yeah, bro, Origami was crazy. That's why I started my Turkey Losing brand. At like that's that place was. Magical, you know what I'm saying? There ain't been no club. Twerk Palooza. Yeah, Twerk is crazy. <laughs> how did Twerk Palooza start? Yeah, Twerk Palooza started. Okay, so we skipping around. So I would say this. Twerk Palooza started right after my dab deal. I went, I was like. Yeah, touch on that. So you make dab on him. Oh, so I, read, I didn't even know this until so, so you said it in a note. So you try to sell dab on him or try to get it to the Migos. And they turned oh, yeah, it down. Yeah. yeah, I had tried to. Uh, I wrote that record for them. Okay. Because it was a dance song. You know what I'm saying? It was just a dance record, but I wrote that record for the Migos. Did you have a connection with them at the time when you wrote it, or it was just like you did it and just tried to, like try to get it to them? I mean, I mean, I knew them. Me and their DJ was kind of cool. We would talk on the mm -hmm. phone here and there. I got them booked at Hampton University uh, with with Rich Homie Quan for like homecoming the the following year, the 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 previous year. So. Uh, I just thought we was cool. You know what I'm saying? I was like, well, shoot. It's like everybody keep doing this dab dance. Like everybody keep dabbing. Like I'm about to make a song for the people that started it because that's what I do. Like, who started the dab? Well, the Migos really, like, they the ones who was presenting it in the music videos and stuff. Like Rich the Kid, Flipper the Skipper, Migos, that whole little conglomerate of people. They was the ones that was dance, dance doing the dab in all the videos, but they would never say what they was doing. It wasn't called the dab yet. It, I mean, it was called dabbing. Okay. That's the name that I got, but they was just doing it, so it was making it look cool in the videos. And I was like, "What the hell is this dance?" So then I met this girl, and she was like, she had Dab Girl in her bio, and I'm like, "What the hell is a Dab Girl?" She's like, "You know Dab, you know Dab, you know like the Migos." I said, "What the fuck?" She was like, "Yeah, it's a, it's a dance." I'm like, I'm from Atlanta. I said, oh, "Okay," and so I got my boy. I was like, "Bro, I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a song for this," and I made it. And when I made it, I was like, I didn't really like it too much, but my manager was like, yo, this is the one. Well, this is, this joint hard. I was like, all right, well, I'm going to call Ray G. I'm going to see what he say. That was Migos DJ at the time. And I called Ray G. I was standing in the middle of my, my, um, my mother's living room, man. I'm about to call Ray G. I said, hey, bro, I got a hit for y'all, boys. I think, you know what I'm saying? This joint will be crazy. You know, I know y'all dabbing on dumb out there. They was on tour with Chris Brown at the time. So I could, like, hear them on the tour bus. And I just was a lot of commotion going on. So He was with them at the time. He was with them at the time. So he was like, all right, send it over. Let me hear it. I said, all right. Send the record over. Oh, so you actually made, like, a reference? You actually made the whole... I made the... No, this was the actual real song that y'all hear today that I sent them. Okay, okay. So he... Uh, he didn't call me back. So I ended up calling him, like, 15 minutes later. Like, did you hear the song? 
He was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I heard the song. He was like, yeah, that's your night, right, bro. I ain't gonna lie, that's your night. He said, Quavo said shit, 30,000. For them to. I said, man, <laughs> I said, Reggie, I don't got $30,000 to pay the Migos for no damn feature. Like, it's not a feature, bro. I wrote the song for y'all. Like, they can keep me on the chorus or keep my ad libs or something like the uhs or whatever, but it's for them. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to write a song for them. He like, well, shoot, man, yeah, it's cool. Like, we gonna, we gonna figure it out well. Like, I just tell her they won't, he won't interest it. You know what I'm saying? He was like trying to hurry up and get me off the phone. So he ended up getting off the phone, and I was standing there. <laughs> I was standing there. My manager was like, well, I guess we're gonna put it on um, YouTube and SoundCloud. I said, man, let's not even do it. It's like, I made it for them. I don't want that song. I don't like that song for real. You he was like, you're you stupid. Wanna I'm gonna do it. Yeah. So he put it up there, bro. And he put it up there on a Tuesday. I'll never forget. He put it up there on a Tuesday, and that was the end of it. I never went back to the SoundCloud. I never went back to the YouTube. Nothing. About four days later, he comes to the house, and he says, yo, bro, have you seen your Twitter? I said, no. He was like, look at your Twitter right now. So I go to Twitter, and it's like, it's a 9-9 plus like at the top of my like notifications. my notifications. So I click on it and it's these little boys, these two little boys, they they took the part of the song where I was like, pause, hold up. You know what I'm saying? Dang, all that. They took that part, made a dance video out of it, and it was already up to like two million views mm. on Vine. So I'm oh, like it's Vine days. It's Vine days. So I said, man, what the hell? So I go to Dub Smash. It's a little girl. What's Dub Smash? Dub Smash was the same thing as Vine. It was just, okay. it was, yeah, something similar. So they're up there, and she has like 2 million views also on the joint. So between Vine and this Dub Smash app, they back and forth. The kid's going crazy. So I'm like, this is crazy. He was like, bro, we need to, we need to promote this ASAP. So we put out, so it was like, you know what we need to do? We and need to. Not, not to cut you off. So he also uploaded it, no video, just the song. No, just on song. YouTube and cover, just cover, just yeah. some bullshit cover. I think he like silhouetted like a person doing the dab and just put it out there. Like it was nothing, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It was still to this day the same cover that we ended up getting signed for, you know what I'm saying? But uh, we ended up putting it out um, that, that day. Well, no, we ended up contacting the kids that did it. And because we were just like, yo, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> y'all doing this, like, yo, can y'all keep doing these? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, can y'all keep doing these videos? So we ended up, like, trying to figure out ways to promote. Now, mind you, this goes back to Batman and Trey Styles, the Def Jam marketing team. I said, bro, we need to market this song like we throwing a party. And mm -hmm. I said, we on Twitter. I said, we need to, it's the first week of school. All the colleges go to School, mind you, I dropped the record August the 30th. Okay. Okay, August the 30th, 2015, I dropped the record. This is the first week of college moving. So this is the weekend of Labor Day weekend. So we like, all these colleges is about to throw parties. They're going to be looking on Twitter to see where the party's at, where the move's at. So if you go to Norfolk State, you know, it's NSU 15, NSU 16, NSU 17, NSU 18. What do you mean? The year that you graduate. So okay. if you so NSU 15 is the year that they're graduating. NSU 16 is the, you know, the juniors. NSU, you know, 17 is the, you know what I'm saying? So, so on and so forth. So we was just pound signing oh, all the like, HBCUs. Like yeah, it's just okay. ta hashtagging. Yeah. We was tagging all the HBCUs and just doing that to the point where it was just like, bro, we didn't want even sleeping. What were you, what was the post? It was just like, um, New dance craze, pound sign, dab on them by Big Will, the party king. Alongside Click, with one of those videos with, that the kids with, were making? The, with the kid with the two oh. boys. Okay. So we was getting reshares, and we were just adding all the girls. We were just firing people, tag them, tag them, tag them, tag them, tag them. See, back then we had this, we was doing it on the computer. So it was like, um, it was called Tweet Hoot or something, like Sweet Tweet Hoot or something like that. So you, we could have multiple pages up. On the laptop, so we doing four tw Twitter pages at one time. Me and Slim just going really like spamming that shit. Yeah, we just spamming. We yeah. going crazy. So this is this is the moment of truth. This is what this is what happened. The first game of the season, LeBron came out and he, he dabbed as he walked out out 
you know, on the court. He walked out to the court, and then he just hit the dab. I don't know who did it, but this is the moment that changed my life. I'm asleep, okay, and I wake up, and I hear, because I, I like to watch ESPN. I love to watch Sports Center and just like highlights in the middle of the night where there's nothing else to watch on, on cable, right? So I'm hearing my song, mm. but I'm thinking that I'm just listening to it, playing, and then it's like I go back to sleep and I wake up because you know it's news. So it plays like every 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? They're playing the same highlight story every 15 minutes. I wake up and it's like, bro, that's just a LeBron James something dab. That clip of him walking out dab. And they put my song on it. Mm. So whoever did that woke up the world at that point. Now I'm gonna tell you how crazy it got. I didn't understand about I don't, I don't like, I'm not into like sports news. Okay. Def Jam AR ended up hitting me up. It was like, hey, bro, I just seen you on a Bleacher Report. I'm trying to see what's up with this song. I said, okay, what's the Bleacher Report? <laughs> he like, man, this is one of the biggest sports blogs out, you know? And you made it up there. You just, it must be something special about this song. I said, okay, well, I'm just contact my manager, y'all talk. I, you know what I'm saying? I'm not interested in having no conversations with nobody. So we ended up getting on Bleacher Report, man, and once we did that, it was like, this was like 8 o'clock in the morning. The guy hit us up from Def Jam. By noon, Nick Cannon hit me. Columbia Records, Sony Records, everybody, bro, it's going, it's going crazy. And this is this more, that morning. Before 12 o'clock, I had to talk to five record labels. They're all trying to do a single deal. They're all trying to, though. They're all trying to, they're just trying to, well, the single situation was then come about until like, Two weeks later, what were they like? What were they trying to do? They were just trying to point? find information about who my the song. Nobody was talking about no deal. They were just what talking was, about what was Nick saying, huh? What, uh, what did Nick Cannon say? My manager talked to Nick. I'm not sure exactly okay. what what he said, but he tweeted first. He tweeted, then they got on the phone because he was talking to everybody. Like you know, he was like, "Bro, Nick Cannon called." Like I'm like, "For real?" He like, "Yeah, that's crazy." Like, was it playing in like the? In the stadium, like when Braun walked out, or they just no. kind of like put it over. They the, put it over, over the. the they put it over the video. Yeah. Okay, yeah so yeah. by the time Braun got to the end of the, the runway, he dabbed. That's when my song dropped. So it was like the build up. Yeah. So we like dab on him, dab on him. As soon as he did the dab, that's when the chorus came in, and it just kept repeating it. It kept doing it, replaying him dab because he only dabbed twice. <laughs> so they just twice. kept on. They just kept, <laughs> yeah. they just kept replaying and replaying and replaying. Looping him, Davin. Looping it, and it just so. Got crazy. So you get all these calls by twelve that day. Yeah, by twelve, and it was it was just up, bro. Like I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't get it, and then it was like the the the, the call that really got me was somebody. Um, I'm not gonna say her name, but somebody called and was like close to Michael Jackson. Like she does like choreography for Mike. You know what I'm saying? She's she's always done choreography for Michael Jackson. And she called and said, hey, now I will tell you this name. She called and said, hey, Sylvia Rohn from Epic Records wants to get on the phone with you. Who's that? Sylvia Rohn. Now, mind you, only reason why I know this person's name is because of Future and DJ Khaled and all of them, you know? So I'm, I know this name from BT. you know what I'm saying? I wanna, let's, let's get on the phone. I'm, I'm trying to get the, the big deals. I'm trying to, like, you know, get with Future and them. I'm like, yo, so let's get on the phone with them. So like, let's get on the phone with her. So they ended up talking, and she was, like, the first conversation that was ta- talking about numbers and deals and single deals, and I need to go with this right now. Like, you need to push the button on this right now. And it's like, you know, I, was, I really wish that I would have went you know, with that direction. Um, but it was like they wasn't trying to move fast enough. Mm. That, you know, so it was like I ended up signing the E1, the Entertainment One, and they ended up pushing the button. And when they pushed the button, bro, my life went crazy within 24 hours, bro. Bro, it's crazy. I, di- I didn't even think that in the Vine days, like, that was blowing music up because that's what it is now. Music right. blows up with TikTok. People just make a TikTok to it. People start using the sound. Right. So that was happening in those days too. Yeah, for sure. That was the beginning of it. I think only, I was like, I feel like, <laughs> I wouldn't say this, but I feel like I was like one of the top three to one go first, viral first. Off just like a Off of songs. Type. Yeah, off of like songs. Like, because mm. it was like, I think it was me. It was like 
um, hit the coin. Hit the coin. Yeah, hit the coin. Yeah. yeah, it was probably somebody else around that time too. Um, it was another dab song that went viral. Uh, I want to roll it, roll it, roll it with a dab. Yeah. They went viral too. That might actually wasn't that actually Amigo song? I think. No, nah, no, nah, that was some okay. two little boys, two little light skinned boys. I think I forgot their names, but they um they had that joint popping. So around Sweet. this time, that yeah. was that was that was one of the three songs that was lit. So you end up doing the deal with you said Evo One. No, Entertainment One. Entertainment One. Yeah. And I think you did a video with them for that, right? Yeah, I did a video okay. for them. Yeah. Is this the one thing in the notes you had, Ro? I actually wanted to read this. You had said, um, you were like, the the buzz kind of only lasted for like a year. Was that about yeah. the, the dab song? Yeah, it only lasted, bro. It was, this is what I learned about the word viral. Like, I learned that viral is bad, right? This is mm. what this is what a label A&R told me. He said, it's cool, but it's it's bad. Why is it bad? And I was just like, well, why? He was just like, because. He said, you're here today, you're talked about, but you're gone tomorrow or next week. And people might even feel like if you go viral, viral, it's like they feel like they have you figured out, so now your sense of mystery is gone. Yeah, it's, it's like so when it's you like, go viral, bro, it's like I learned. Like, I don't want to, I don't, like, I just, I told myself I just never want to go viral, right? I said, I don't never want to go viral again, but I keep going viral. You right? go viral on it's like, I keep going viral, right? <laughs> so it's like I don't want to go viral no more. It's like every time I go viral, shit, it's like it doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't make me little baby or nothing. You know what I'm saying? But it's like consistently, bro. It's like my song, the songs, the person that I am. It's like the people love my music, and it's like I make them dance. You know what I'm saying? I don't do drill. I don't. You know what I'm saying? I make party music, and it's not like just party music. I'm remixing songs that's hits. You know what I'm saying? I'm bringing songs that every, that was dead uh, back alive. You know what I'm saying? Just off of these party breaks that I'm doing. And then I got a lot of sounds on TikTok, a lot of just beats that I make. And just, you know what I'm saying? It's just a lot of things that I just be creative, just playing around, and it just goes viral. And I don't even uh. put the credit up there sometimes. I don't put my voice up there. I don't put made by big, like none of that. I just let the world just have it. Going viral can, I feel like, ruin some people especially if you don't have your foundation built yeah if you don't really have like any other work and you just have this one video or whatever one piece of thing go viral a lot of people don't really know how to move forward from that no for sure you know? they don't they don't so right. i guess you, you realize how kind of fickle the industry was and fans were yeah through that you. song was there a moment when you realized like okay I'm, the clout might, might, might be kind of dying down from that song oh uh, yeah but bro I've, <laughs> i felt like the clout was over with Probably about as that spring of that year when the label stopped calling me back. Like the label mm. wasn't even calling me no more. You gotta understand, bro. And somebody said this to me, and I'm, I'm gonna say this on this podcast. And it's the first time that I ever said this to somebody. I'm gonna say this: If Cam Newton would have won the Super Bowl, I would have been a millionaire that year. Period. Cam uh -huh. dabbed his way all the way to the Super Bowl that year. Every touchdown, Cam dabbed. That was all that ESPN was talking about. Every Damn. time Cam scored, he dabbed. Every time his teammates scored, he dabbed. It was like a dab was dab going crazy. And my song was Cam Newton's theme song. So it was like... He was actually playing it like on the field? Yeah, bro. We so... Yeah. In the locker rooms, bro. Bro, every... every Bro, Shaq, Ludacris, Jermaine Dupree, everybody made videos to my song. Mm. Everybody. So you gotta understand that this is the this is why the Migos wasn't fucking with me for a while because this was just like they were like, man, I should have got we should have got that song. I mean, like. it's, 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 I don't even want to go into that. I told myself I'll never like carry that situation or talk about. I was meant that. to be though. Yeah, it's it's cool. It's all love, like you know what I'm saying. So, but I feel like at that moment, all of those people that was doing my song, bro, they they brought it to life, and it's like Cam Newton was the one because he was the number one quarterback that year. You know, he was just he won every game. Until he got to the Super Bowl. So it was like that next morning. He was dabbed out. Bro, the next morning, it was like the world tried to kill the dab. It was like, mm. dab is dead. It's over. It's, uh, it's done. And I think that's when the labels just got oh, scared. Geez. Like, Big Will, I don't know. Well, I'm like, he ain't win the Super Bowl. Like. Now, mind you, I had to say, I'll tell you my deal. I had a deal, but I had an option. So I, the first check that they sent me, I was supposed to get a remix. Okay. Okay. The remix never happened because Cam lost. Who was supposed I to be can't on the tell you. I can't okay. tell you. <laughs> okay. I can't tell What's you. What's the option? But just let me the option. The option is this: like, so when you get a single deal, the label will sign you for that song, 
plus if you come up with a hotter song for your next single. So if you, if I drop, so if I'm what I have a dab on them, and I just drop another song, and that song is catching on fire too, the label would take that. But if a third song catch on fire, now they gotta renegotiate the deal. So okay. it's a single with option. So I guess you already have the numbers for if that second one goes up, you already know how much they'll give you for it. Yeah, it's the same price as the first one. Okay. So if I sign for a hundred thousand dollars, they'll give me a hundred thousand dollars again. Now the third song, they're not gonna give me a hundred thousand dollars. Now I can renegotiate and say, look, I want two hundred fifty thousand dollars. See what I'm saying? But I never got that far. Because of the dad being dead, <laughs> the deal was mm. just done. It was over. It was dead. It was a wrap. And it's, and it's attached to a dance, so it's kind of probably only as cool as as long as the dance is cool. Yeah, for sure. But it's a moment of history, though. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'll never take away, bro. One thing about it, I always tell people, like, bro, I'm not famous, bro. Like, they would, I'm like, bro, I never made it to the point. Like, Drum, like, to me, Drum's famous. To me. Drum, mm, Drum sure. tours the world. He has songs with Erica Badu. He is a fucking rap star. Big Will just had a record that was just worldwide. But I never left VA. I never became nothing too crazy. I never toured. I never did radio interviews. I never was on a breakfast club. I never, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, I feel like I'm just so consistent, bro. And I just, I'm always going crazy. Like, I'm always working. So it makes me look like, damn, this nigga famous too. But I don't feel that way. I love the fact that people look at me the way that they look at me. But to me, I got a lot of work to do. That's why I never fall off, bro. It's been 2015, it's 2024, and I'm still lit. I got more views on my last record than I had with Dab. How did Who Sexy, I'm Sexy become bigger than my fucking hit record? How did it? The world. The world transitioned. I heard Jay-Z say it. He said, in the next couple of years... The biggest records in the world is going to be no lyrics. It's going to be all beats. He said this on an interview before. I don't remember what interview it was, but Jay-Z said that. Fast forward 2023, 2024. All that Baltimore club, Jersey club, Afro beat sounding type of records. These EDM DJs is one of the biggest artists in the world, bro. The DJs is making artists money. You're, they're paying these DJs $500,000 to do festivals. That's crazy. That's love. That's that's you know because you don't ha you have beats with no words, and that's where the world is at right now. And I feel like who's sexy? I'm sexy. Ain't nothing but a whole bunch of a whole bunch of just beats and repetitive lyrics. Who's sexy? I'm sexy. Fuck it up. Fuck it up. Fuck it up. That's it. But the world loves to dance. The world loves to have a good time, bro. All yeah. that drilling and stuff like yeah. that doesn't get you far. It's not gonna get you far for a long time. These those pop records. Those, you know, those one dance Drake type of records, they're going to live forever, bro. They're going to forever be mm -hmm. big records. And that's the type of music that I want to try to keep making because it's like I'm never going to fall off, bro, if I keep doing that because I can remix the hottest record that's out right now like I did with Cora Ray. She dropped, she dropped that record. I remixed it. Her record was dying out. I remixed it. I brought it back to life. Mm. Not, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. The record slowed down. I did my remix, and it basically sped the process back up. And it got crazy. My my version was getting played in New York City more than the regular version. And I don't have a record deal. Big Will's on the record. Big Will's on the radio every day in New York City. Hot 97. Getting played by one of the two top DJs in the world. Are you? Are they paying you for this at that time? No. Because it's a remix. Okay. So it's like I don't own the record. I just, I just that's that's just like a fat man scoop type of thing. You just put your vocals over it, you hype it up. It's a DJ thing, and that's all that. But see, that's the thing too that these labels are trying to figure out for me now. Like, how can we make him do this? But it's like an unofficial remix because these 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 songs need to be like they love these songs. If you ever see how they're releasing these records now. You'll understand exactly what I'm trying to say. They'll do the regular version, the dirty version, acapella version. They'll do the sped up the sped version, version yeah. the slow down version. They never did this before. But all of these different versions is making so much money equally different. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So it's like when that when Big Will does his Big Will thing, it's another situation where they're trying to be like, okay, we got to figure this out. I think they were they started with like the sped up version and all that because that's what kids were doing on to it on TikTok. Mm -hmm. So like let's just get ahead of it. Let's already just drop it with the sped up version. No, for sure. They can stream our version. Like, no, for sure. Because I got the remix that I do, bro. I'm, I'm sampling R. Kelly. I'm sampling people like I'm sampling shit. 
that can't get cleared. You know, and it's, these records is millions and millions of streams, millions and millions of views. So they like, well, Will, what the fuck? Like, your your songs are getting played at the damn award shows, but we can't get you no money behind it because you don't own the damn song. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, we just trying to figure it out, man. Something will happen, though. So Dab On It was the first song you even put out? Yeah, Dab On It was all, not, not the first song I ever put out. Okay. I had songs out way before Dab On them. Like, just records, just records that, you know, this area was liking or whatever. But that was my first big record, yeah. I think you did a remix on a Nicki Minaj song, right? Yeah, Everybody. Everybody. I seen, I was watching your live, I think I caught it after, but you were on live one time for like an hour, I think, yeah. doing the ad-libs for that song. Yeah, play And, bro, around. you were fucking working. Like, by the end of that, you were sweating. Like, you were out of yeah. breath. I was like, bro, it's really like, this is a fucking... <laughs> nah, bro. This is what I do, man. This is just, this, 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 that's my talent, bro. I love, I love, like to host and hype things up. That's just what I do for real. And it's like, I love to do it live. That's why I can't wait to go on tour because I can do it live. Like, when I'm doing, when I'm live, that's when you really feel it. Because I've been seeing people, I can make thugs, gangsters. Like, they look at me smiling. Like, yo, big boy, you rocking this bitch. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, they don't even want to, they don't want to move. They don't want to dance. Like, big boy, you got all the girls in here going crazy. They're like, oh, Yeah, they like, like, man, you making me dance. Like, big boy, got me in here dancing, you know? But it's, it's crazy. The live show is definitely... Because I look up to a lot of good performers, bro, like Busta Rhymes, Bow Wow, Nelly. Like, the way that they perform, the way that they records is just so worldwide and big. Like, that's the type of shit that I nah, look up bro, to. Nah, bro, I was actually sleeping on Busta Rhymes. I think Busta Rhymes might be, like, the best performer alive. Ever. Maybe ever. I haven't seen everybody, obviously. Ever, but bro. What bro, next I, seen him at, I like Usher, too. Okay, yeah, 50. I think 50 came on the tour last year mm -hmm. out here where was it was it not the, not the, the amphitheater, North, the amphitheater. Mm -hmm. i was there bro first of all my childhood was complete like yeah. seeing 50 perform he he went crazy but then buster rhymes was out there and i seen him really perform and i was just bro i was amazed because he puts he, on a and like show. you know how the dude like be like turning his volume down right when he's rapping and he's like the, like it's like bro. the lyrics go away yeah, like yeah, yeah. Like, him and spliff i think he has the best dj and the best hype man like you have that package it's like with me there's only certain DJs in Virginia that it's like when you work with Big Will, we put a show on. Me and Izzy the DJ. Izzy, when me and Izzy get together, bro, it's like Shaq and Kobe, bro. It's like we don't have to even see each other. We just, we know what we about to do. Isn't he Glass's brother? Is that Izzy? Izzy the producer. Okay, my fault. Oh, that's, oh yeah, that's Izzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is, he wilding too. He got some stats on his, on his belt too. Izzy, cool. So Dab on him takes off. Mm -hmm. I'm, were you still throwing parties and doing stuff no, outside man. of that song while that's the, taking the off? Song, so the song going like, did crazy. you use that traction to gear it towards something else? No, like? no, that's how we about to get into Turk Palooza. Okay. So that record, it was over with to me in six months. Okay. And I remember, bro, it's like one thing about it is is this too. You know, people get these record deals or people get money and they they act funny. They change, you know, they start to act weird to their friends or People that supported them before the fame, you know. One thing about me that I'm always that I'm thankful for that I just I've always been Big Will, you know. I've always been me. I've never changed. I've never ever was just cocky and conceited and just didn't want to be around people. Like I always would get mad when my manager used to make me sit in the house on the weekend because they just thought I was just so famous to go outside. Like, no, mm -hmm. well, you don't need to go out today. They ain't nobody paying you. I'm just like, man, I want to go outside with the people that like. I'm just trying to go up in there. Like, no, because if you walk in, they're going to give you the mic. You're going to have to perform. You're going to have to host. I'm just like, so what? Who cares? Like, we home. You know what I'm saying? We in VA. This home. But that's why I always kept that energy because if I would have been an asshole or act like I was better than everybody when I got all that money or got that deal, when I got, when I, when the money went away, those people wouldn't have came and supported me no more. I was able to make more money than I had with the dad when I created Twerk Palooza. And that's how we get to Twerk Palooza, because I went back broke after the dab deal. It was all good, but you got to understand, the money that they gave me, it wasn't for Big Will to go and splurge and get jewelry in. No, they gave me money. To make the next record. To, to No, to market that record. Okay. So say this. I'm not going to say the number that I got, but let's, 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 do, this, let's do this real small. Say they give me fifty thousand. Okay. Out of that fifty thousand, the lawyer gets ten percent. So what are you down at? What's that? Is that five thousand? Five thousand. Yeah, Forty-five. Yeah. Okay. Then say, after that, you have to pay for your video. 
which is ten thousand. So now well, you're 10, down to video is crazy. That's now like, you're down to what? Thirty five. Thirty five. All right. So within that thirty five, say you have to pay for marketing, and you find out how much marketing is. You like what? So you telling me to put my song on around the whole world, right? Basically, it costs thirty thousand for that. All right, but it's only at mix show. It's only at mix show. It's not like I'm just, you know. What does that mean? Mix, mix show? show is like the DJs get an email to say, "Hey, this is the record that we're pushing for this month. We need. We're paying the label. We're paying your your station for every mix show DJ. So if you go for like Traffic Jam mix or the late night before the club mix, the DJs is playing these records, but they have to throw in the dab. They gotta yeah. throw in my song as they're mixing these records." You see what I'm saying? That's that's big show. So that's what you go to first. So when a label wants to put in another hundred thousand or two hundred thousand into your record, that's when you hear Drake all damn day on the radio. They're paying for those They're slots. They're paying for these slots. They're paying for Drake to be on the radio all goddamn day. They're paying for whatever song is popping in New York City so to be on the so radio. So nothing all day. on radio is organic. It's all paid for. I mean, shit. I, I wouldn't know these days, but trust me, damn near. Cause I feel like Drake is fire enough and big enough to where he shouldn't really have to. Like, but the label, I mean, you gotta understand, Drake's supposed to be universal. So it's like whatever Universal is gonna say, yo, I need y'all to play these X Y Z records. That's what they're gonna play. Until that another record gets traction or it goes viral or whatever, then they'll play those records. But yeah, everything is just everything's paid for, bro. Dead ass. So I had paid so say thirty thousand dollars. So say what we down now? Like five, bro. So Where you, so you went broke after Dad pretty much reinvested in it, trying to put it back into the song. So they, uh, the money that they gave me was way more than that. Okay. Everything that I'm telling you right now was way more than that. Okay. The only thing that I can tell you is my video was ten thousand. So if my video is ten thousand, shit, everything else was damn near forty thousand, fifty thousand for for shit. So once everything's paid for, now it was like okay, well shit, I gotta pay the label back what they gave me. So, that's, so this is an advance. This is an advance. Okay. Right? So at the end of the day, it's like, shit, I got to wait for that those streams. And, you know, you're not going to see so no how more. how are you getting paid then if that's an advance? Shows. You okay. know, thank God that my song was big enough that I was getting shows. I was getting 5000 a show at the time. So I did like six I did like six HBCU homecoming concerts. I, I did a show in Colorado. That was cool. I got five thousand for that. I got five thousand for all the shows that I that I did. Was shout out to shout out to um, Tanisha and Dope, Creative Nation and them. They definitely put me on the road. So, so I guess the the label didn't have any system set up for you actually to make money no. with them. That you had to kind of do it on your own. By yeah, you had to figure. But see, that's what any artist, bro. They give you this money and you expect them to babysit you. They're not gonna babysit you. Not babysit you, but at least have some type of system in place to where if I sign with you. I'm getting money from streams or this, that. But no, I mean, you're getting money from you. streams, but yeah. you got to understand, if you take that advance, they got to make that money back off of your streams, off of your mechanicals, off of your YouTube, off of whatever. only thing that you can keep is your show money. You know, they they own, they to this day, they own Dab on them. Big Will doesn't own that shit. 100% I don't it. own Dab on them. Mm. They own Dab on them. Was that part of your original deal? That's a part of everybody's deal when they sign for a single. Really? Ain't nobody owning shit, bro. Nobody. Not for real. You don't got to understand. That label say, yo, your song is hot as a bitch. I want to sign you. They really saying, I want to own you. They, <laughs> they, yeah, what the fuck? Basically, you know what I'm saying? So any artist that got a deal that's that got a single song, that's a song that's popping, the label basically buys that song from them to push. It's their, it's their own investment. And when I found out how much money the label made off of me, bro, that's another part of my life that opened my eyes saying, damn, I know what I won't do again, and I know how to do this damn. So it's like when I found out, like I'm saying, I'm not going to tell you real numbers, but just say they gave me 100000 and they made $2 million. But you didn't really make anything directly from the, your partnership. All I got was the 100000 That's You know that what I'm saying? You had to pay back. I had to pay that back, of course, but yeah. I get my mechanicals, I get my, you know, Publishing and stuff like that, but if they're giving me a hundred thousand, they made one point three or two point eight million off of me the first year. It's like, mm -hmm. damn, they made that much money and I only got a hundred grand. So where'd they get their money from? Where's streams? It's streams, okay. Yeah, because they own the song now. Okay. Only thing I'm getting is my mechanicals and the publishing, which is in the contract. You like, like I said, I don't give you numbers. What's but mechanical? Say, 
Mechanicals is just like um, streaming. This is streaming. It's a whole bunch of points. It's a point system. Okay. So it's like 25% of, of whatever. So if you got 100% of your publishing is 50, then outside of that, you go down to 20% of your mechanicals. It's like, oh, this is going to be your check every two months that come in the mail for your publishing. Like, type, it's bullshit. It's a little bit of money. It ain't yeah. no money for real. They're seeing damn near 70%. Million. Yeah, they're seeing yeah. mad bread. Bro, it's like, nah, it's like, I want to be the label now. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah. what makes you think, like, damn, how much How much did they make? Damn, so they don't owe me no more money? They're like, no. Hell no. They don't owe you shit. Bro, checking the books, like, you sure? Like, it's Yeah, like, damn, no emails. I'm trying to call around. Like, nobody, so, nobody put on the phone. Uh, like, he, damn. So, okay, so how did, I guess, going broke with from Dab on him lead to Twerk Palooza? So... I went broke for dad. Dad, it was just over with, bro. Like, no more money. When I say when I say broke, I don't mean broke. Like, I'm, I still got money because I'm still doing little shit here and there. But when I say broke, I'm talking about like all them racks that I had was gone because all the money that I had was spent on the song. It wasn't like I was irresponsible or I did some wild shit. I ain't buy no chains. I ain't did nothing. I bought a couple clothes and shit here and there. But I ain't even paid for a trip. You know what I'm saying? I didn't do shit because all the money went into the song. So after that, we fucked around and was like, well, we don't got no more money, so shit, what are we going to do? And my manager, this is one reason why the manager that I had at the time ended up separating from me because it was like, he told me, he said, yo, it's either we focus on this music, bro. I'm not focusing on this party shit with you no more. Like, focus on this music. I'm just like, bro, the party is making me money. Like, it's like the drug game. Like, you want to get viral or not. Yeah, it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's like you want to go out here in the streets, you want to sell crack, you want to sell weed because it's making you money right now. He like, bro, focus on another song. He said, bro, the labels are still on your ass. Like, you, it's not like you didn't do what you just did 18, eight months ago. Like, you still big will. I was like, I don't care about that. I want to make some money right now. So I ended up coming up with Turk Palooza, and this is by the grace of God, bro. It's like, I'm telling you, my blessings, it just be back to back to back, bro. Um... I got a call from my mans. I said, yo, what's up? He said, yo, we on our way to VA tomorrow. What y'all got going on? No, he said, we on our way to VA next week. What y'all got going on? I said, shit, I ain't doing too much. I got a party called Twerk Palooza. He like, put, 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 put him on there. I said, oh, he like, man, put him on there. I said, let me talk to this nigga, man. I ain't talked to this nigga in years. It was Bow Wow. Mm. So, so Bow, like, I'm coming to do my last interview at the Breakfast Club. So I'm coming through VA. I want you to put me on a flyer, nigga. Let's do it. Like, I'm like, you playing. Now, mind you, me and Bow used to be running each other crazy when we was kids. You know what I'm saying? But Bow ain't been to Virginia since he was 15, 16 years old. I think you said you opened up for him when you were like a kid, right? Yeah, Somewhere. yeah, yeah. That's right. where you guys opened met? Up for Bow. I was on tour with Bow. My dad was Bow bodyguard. It was a lot. Oh, man. wow. Okay. Yeah, me and Bow go back years. But, so he wasn't even trying to charge you. He was just like, no, he was like, yo, we coming through the city, but we got to drive through there to get to New York. So we just gonna come through, fuck with you. I said, all right, I put Bow on the flyer, bro. Shut the internet damn down. And this is the first ever Twerk Palooza. This is the first ever Twerk Palooza, bro. This is before I thought that I was gonna make this a brand. So Bow ended up coming, sold out. We sold it out, bro. It was it was over with, and it was so crazy because that night, literally that night. I was uh, I was about, I was about probably like, I probably had like four thousand dollars to my name at that time, bro. That night we made dollars, mm. and I said, how the hell did I just make all this money? And it's just like it was for free, like free money, you know what I'm saying? Like I didn't, I have no expenses for real. Like Bow came, he didn't charge me. It was just like, God just put this money like, all right, well, I'm about to give you one more chance to get your life together. And from that point on, I created that brand. And it was over, bro. The next time I threw Turk Palooza, it was dollars. It was a day party. I was like, nah, this doesn't work. So I was trying shit until something stuck. The day party didn't work. The day party didn't work. Then I threw another Turk Palooza. At a smaller venue, I was like, well, I don't think this is the style for Twerk Palooza. Like, I was trying things out. By the time I got to Broadway, I was like, oh, yeah, this is, this, I need to have a venue that's this big. 
how that's a nightclub. That was a nightclub. That's the whole like eight, eight, 800. 800? That's a yeah. big ass nightclub, though. Then it's like, it was like Broadway was cool, but I liked Origami's look. I liked the lights. I liked the sound. I liked the stage. When I threw Twerk Palooza at Origami, bro, we cleared that night. And mm. I said, you know what? That's it. Fuck it. Throw the flag in. Look, though, our WAP, everybody come in. Let me talk to y'all. Um, how can I house this brand here? And they was like, well, shit, let's come up with a plan. And then they was like, we're gonna throw this, we're gonna throw this brand, this party every holiday. So every time there's like a, a day, like Memorial Day weekend, if nobody gotta go to work or school on that Monday, we're gonna throw this party on that, on that Sunday. It was if always on Sundays. It was no, 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 no. It was always holiday weekends. Okay. So Thanksgiving weekend, we might throw it the day before, like that Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Um, July 4th, we we'll are throw it on the 3rd because don't nobody got to go work at school on the 4th. So it was like holidays. We were, bro, we was killing it. And what's the formula? So it's DJ spinning and you're hosting. No, I never got on the mic at Twerk Palooza, bro. I might do my little Big Wheel, one, two. They play the, the song. I might perform or hype it up or whatever. But I, my DJs control that, bro. I'm outside running a party the whole time. So what's the formula for Twerk Palooza? Twerk Palooza is just, you know, two DJs, host, um, and my, my team of girls, man, I got 30 girls on one team. And that's the street team that's like that's promoting it. That's the street it. team. That's, that's, that's my twerkers. That's the, that's the street team. Those are the girls that go hard for me, bro. Mm. They go hard for the team, like all of my girls, bro. And it's like, it, it, the girls come and change. It's, they change in and out, you know what I'm saying? So you might got girls that was in college that might graduate college and now they're no longer around. And we recruit, we recruit three or four more girls and... New, it's just, bro, it's just recycle, bro. girls is crazy. Bro, it's, yeah. this is what we do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it works, bro. And it's like, I've been going strong since 2017 with this brand, bro. So you lock in with Origami. You're you're throwing them strictly there now. Strictly Nowhere there. Nowhere else. Yeah, until Origami gets shut down. Why'd they get shut down? Um, city shit, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I can speak on that. What did you do when it when it got shut down with Twerk Palooza? We were sad. <laughs> like, yeah. The whole world was sad. First of all, everybody was sad that Origami shut down for one, because that was the number one club in Virginia at the time. <clears throat> so everybody was just sad that that club shut down. But the fact that we housed that brand there, and it has it to me, to me, I mean, Twerk Palooza is Twerk Palooza. I'm, I'm grateful to be able to still throw that brand and still have successful numbers, but I don't think it's going to ever feel in Virginia out here. Like it felt at Gami those days, you know what I'm saying? So I mean, I got it at I got it at Soko coming up Memorial Day weekend. Um, we definitely gonna do good, you this know. This year, yeah, this you know what I'm saying like next Sunday. So I mean, it's gonna be you know it's gonna be dope. It's gonna be what it's gonna be. But those Gami days, bro, it was just the best like mm. ever. I know they're shutting. They shut a few um, venues down in Norfolk right now. They're talking about because of the crime or. This, yeah, that and it's really fucking up like with the DJs because yeah. I don't know like right now from what I see like the scene out here is majority DJs like these past six months mm -hmm. it hasn't been that many performances like the DJs is really what's holding it down they're the ones Not that are sure. throwing the events giving the shit to go to go out and have fun yeah um, Not for sure the DJs is definitely stepping it up though I ain't gonna lie. We we tried to get the DJs to understand that years ago. Um, I'm not I'm not a I wouldn't say that I'm a part of the DJ community, but I would say because I host and I work with the DJs that I know what struggles they've been having. I know the things that they've been going through, like with people trying to like undercut them with their prices and yeah. you know, them just like not being on the microphone where they need to they need to learn how to not have a host. They don't do that for real. Out no, here. The DJs they don't. that I that I fuck right here, they don't really say anything no, on the mic. But that's those are the DJs that if you was in Vegas or if you was in L.A., Houston... And you have to. You have to. They don't give a fuck about no host. Hey, like, Big why, Will's like, here. Why give the DJ so quiet They don't tonight. care about like, that, huh? They're like, why the DJ so quiet? Like, I don't know, bro. This, I feel you know like they like, have If you're somewhere else not doing it, that's what the crowd's thinking. I don't know. This, I mean, this, some DJs just got it in them, bro. But some DJs just don't. A lot Man. of DJs, bro, I ain't going to lie. Like, dude, people, I, know, I know a guy that he's very quiet. He's an introvert. But he's an amazing DJ. He doesn't fucking be on the mic. He doesn't talk, but he is a fucking amazing DJ. That's a lot of DJs. That's a lot of people that doesn't like to talk, but they're amazing DJs. I feel like they just, they express themselves through that, through that board, yeah, and they man. go crazy. You know I what think, I'm saying? I think the reason it's working is um, kind of like we were talking about earlier. It's like a, you're, you're doing a service for the people. Yeah. So it could be harder to get people to come out for a performance. Like for like a showcase or something. Yeah, for sure. But if they if they want to go out and drink and have a good time, which everybody does, it's easier to get them to pull up to this spot where they know it's just gonna be music spinning. It's at yeah. a bar. It's at a club. Yeah, for sure. It's easier to get people there. 
Yeah, for sure. And so, it almost like goes back to like the origins of hip hop. Like that's how it's really how it really started. Right. No, that's a fact. Virginia club scene though, it's, it's getting it's getting a little bit better because it, it fell off bad. You mm. know what I'm saying? I think the pandemic fucked a lot of shit up. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna keep it hundred. Twerk Palooza before the pandemic, crazy. After tour, after the pandemic, it was like we don't want to go outside no more. We put mm. a team to get people to come outside. Clubs, like we had so many dope clubs, and it's just like it failed because the people just wasn't supporting it. Like you, you know, you can't open an establishment up and you can't pay your bills. It's not working. People not coming outside no more. The world not going outside for real. Like when you think about it, in these these type of markets, I don't know if this is like a C market, if they classify this area as like a C market, but this is not an A market. Oh, like, like a a a like you know New York is an A, L A is an A, Vegas is an A, A list, A list, right? Yeah. So I don't know if this is like a B or a C market, but I'm telling you, all those all all the areas that it's like this, like Virginia, our area, all the nightlife is just it went downhill. You know what I'm saying from from here to Myrtle Beach. Myrtle mm. Beach nightlife sucks, they said. Myrtle Beach used to be that shit. Really? Yeah, hell they yeah. Say Virginia, Years Virginia ago, Beach man. was that they say Virginia Beach was like Miami before Miami. They they it was. It was like they said it was they said it was Virginia Beach and then it was Daytona Beach. That before is it got to Miami. Florida, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. They said it was between Virginia Beach and Daytona Beach and then Miami mm. caught caught fire and it was just it's Bro, been Miami every since. Yeah, season. Virginia Beach is like I think the longest strip of beach in America, maybe in the world. Nah, that's it's like right. a record for like, you know what I'm saying, how long the actual beach is. No, nah, for sure. Um it's so a nice beach for real. We was just over there today. It was cool. So you're doing a twerk paloozas and that's every year. That's that started like 2017, 18. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I wanted to ask you about so in the notes you say you said that you helped book Nicki Minaj for at the O2 Arena. That was my and first I, booking, and I was weak because you were like made twenty thousand. That's when I fell in love with booking. Yeah, I was lonely, like, bro. <laughs> like ever since, ever since, like because it's like it's like different. It's different. It's different hats that I wear. I'm a host. I'm a, I'm a DJ. I'm a songwriter. I'm an artist. But it's like when it comes to the business, like I'm a manager. I'm a booking agent. Like I'm an event planner. Like I just do so many things, bro. But Concerts is my goal. When I get into my forties and my fifties, like I know what I want to do. I want to throw arena shows. I want to throw tours. I want to have one of the biggest companies in the world, like Live Nation. Mm. That's my goal. That's what Big Will wants to do. So it's like back then, it was a, it was like a. um, I was really cool with with um, Little Chucky. He used to be Lil Wayne and them back in the day. And his dad called and was like, Yo, Will. We uh, we have this booking. Hey, no, this he was like, yo, will you know if you ever got anybody that wants to book any of our new artists like Mac Main or Gutter Gutter or anybody, just call us. You know, I'm like, all right, cool. You know, so maybe a year goes by, and I ended up meeting this lady, and she had she said, um, one of my partners is about to do some shows across seas. Do y'all have your passport? I was like, nah. This like, yeah, man, you're a big dude. You do security. I said, no, I ain't a security guard. Like. I'm a star. Like, you know, I'm playing with I'm like, I need security. Like, she like, what? I'm like, yeah. I, just, I said, I got a lot of celebrity friends and stuff like that. I DJ for Pretty Ricky, da 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 whatever. She like, oh, for real? She was like, yo, do you know how we can contact Nicki Minaj? I said, I mean, well, should I know somebody that know Nicki? She said, listen, if you can contact Nicki Minaj and we can book every show that we book with her in London, I would give you $5,000 every show that we book with her. Just for you making the call. I said, shit. Called. I said, I, hey, yeah. big man, what's up, man? Uh, oh, they trying to book Nikki for the old two arena in London. Da, 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 da. He like, all right, well, I'm about to put people on the phone. Da, 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 da. I forgot Nikki's manager at the time, Dave. But I think her and Wayne had the same manager. And we ended up getting on the phone. Contracts were sent. And it was like, she said, hey, um, you have a bank? And I'm just like, no, nah, like shit. We got Western Union. You can Western Union this, you know, five dollars. She said, "Yeah, we can Western Union. That's fine. It's cool." So she ended up locking in that first date, and then she called me, sent me the five thousand Western Union. I was, I was happy as hell. Like, I was like, "Oh, that's cool." She called me back two days later and said, "Well, I got fifteen more thousand dollars for you." She booked three more we shows. We just booked three more shows. And it's you not to leave the crib. You're really just making a phone call. I'm just like, bro, what the fuck? So I started to get into booking agents. And, like, them getting the 10%, 20% off of these artists when they book them. 
And I was like, damn, yo, like these artists come out here to Virginia, but nobody don't really come out here to Virginia for real. So I started to just call the labels and just started acting like shit. I was somebody important. The whole time I really wasn't. I was like, yo, I'm a book agent from Virginia. My name Big Will. You know, I got these clubs out here. If y'all ever want to, you know, some labels is like, well, shit, yeah, we we definitely looking for this and we looking for that and we looking for this, we looking for that. That's how I met Travis Porter. I ended up booking Travis Porter for ten thousand dollars and Charlie Boy and I think Lloyd. that's the one you said you lost. Yeah, money I ended on. up losing ten thousand. No, this is I ended up bringing Travis Porter out here, booking them, but I actually doubled back and did it did my own show with Travis Porter okay. and I ended up losing ten thousand dollars on them. But that was it was a rainy day. It was a it was just a bad day, bro. It was a storm. It was just that's the that's the promoter's worst nightmare, bro. The rain. I'm telling you. Mm. $10,000 Travis Porter, they, they're like one of the top groups at this time, too. And the weather fucked it all up, bro. When I say fucked it all up, fucked it all up. Bro. So it was outdoor then? Where, where was that at? No, it was at the club. It was just a bad storm. Like, oh, Virginia Beach was flooded damn near. You know what I'm saying? They, they didn't even leave that next day. They ended up staying a whole nother day because it was so bad, you know? You also touched on Live Nation. Like, you want to start something like that. Yeah, I know a lot. I know a big thing with Live Nation um, that I've heard. I don't know if they changed it now, but that they don't let artists that like sell their tickets with them. They don't let them get the data for like the people that buy the tickets. Okay. Are you thinking about data? Are you when you're throwing all these parties and everything you're doing? Are you trying to get people's numbers, emails? Yes. Are you trying to build a? I'm actually I'm actually on the phone with a guy. Um, he's a graphic designer from Hampton. Um, I just asked him. I said, bro, do you know how to build? apps do you know how to build this i'm going to get the data from this because i'm trying to have everybody so i had this idea you know and i'll tell you this because this is already kind of in motion so i can tell you so i was going to have 757 big will and i was going to make 757 big will like something where if you was a dollar number one time it's going to automatically go into a system okay so 757 big will is like you want to see what i got going on for that day you know, you can voicemails, whatever, whatever, but it's going to be a situation where we'll put up billboards and just set five seven Big Will. It's like, Big Will is the number one party promoter in, in Virginia. Like, you want to know where the party at? Call this number. You want to know where everybody at? Call this number. And that's how I'm going to build this, this database. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like it's like Mike Jones back in the day where he used that number and it's like everybody just... But I'm from 757. This is our area code and my name, Big Will. And it works. It's three numbers. It's four, you know, four numbers at the end. 757 Big Will, you just can't lose with that. And I, and I thought about that last year. And I said, yo, I'm going to figure out a way for everybody to call me so I can have Bro, everybody's number. Data is like where the money's at right now. No, well, for sure. Not even just in music and like in a social media, <clears throat> like social media companies. All of them are trading and selling our data. Like, You've seen the documentary where it's like, we're using it for free. Mm -hmm. We think we're getting a service, but we're actually the product. No, for sure. They're getting money off our data. No, for you know sure. I mean? Everybody everybody needs that, bro. Emails, like, you don't understand, bro. I can go to sleep, wake up, and be like, I want to throw a party tonight. I can push one button. It's going to send out 5,000 emails. Mm. So everybody be like, shit, it's up to them if they want to come, but shit, they got that email. You know, so my database right now, email-wise, is over 40,000 40, Gmails. Come on. 40,000. And, and, and then social media apps come and go. But that's from Twerk Palooza data. That's from Eventbrite data. 40,000. 40,000. Emails. So, so, so that's 40, from RSVPs have been to, Twerk to ticket sales. Yes, Damn. bro. 47,000 I'm at right now. 47. 47. Mm. And that's from 2017 to now. Well, look, bro. We like an hour and a half in. I don't want to take up too this much of your time. This was supposed to be this long, I know, I know we could probably go into a lot more that stuff. That's crazy. Um, is there anything you want to leave the people with? Twerk Palooza, that's this Sunday. This Sunday morning day weekend, so called Lounge, man. It's going to be crazy, as always, man. Shout out to everybody that supported me, that's been rocking with me from day one. All my music, all the DJs that play my songs all across the world, man. I love all y'all, man, for real. Big Will. Come on. I appreciate you, bro. No, for sure. I'm inspired. I feel like you're one of the people from the city that's doing like some real cool shit. I'm excited to see what else you got coming. Not for sure. Um, hell yeah, we appreciate you guys for tuning in. All bros, links will be in the description. Yeah. This will be out on what's today? Sunday. This will be out Wednesday. So if you're watching this, work Palooza is Sunday. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, we'll see y'all soon. Peace. Yeah. Come on.